2020 has turned out to be a pretty uncomfortable year. Would you agree? I put a meme up on the screen. It says, me being prepared for 2020. Then it's got the 2020 with the arrow shot right through the helmet there. If that's how you're feeling this morning, I don't think you're alone. Not just in America, by the way, but globally, 2020 is a very uncomfortable year. A global pandemic uh, in our own nation, riots and protests, civil unrest with racial tensions, with Floyd and even this last week with Blake who was shot in the back seven times. We have an election coming up that if you listen to both sides, you would believe that the soul of the nation is at risk and being saved either way. And if you pick one side, you're either picking the devil or the savior either way. And I look towards November, and I'll be honest, as a pastor, I'm anxious either way what happens because half the nation's going to be very ticked off. And what will that mean for us as we seek to move together as a church? And so we look at 2020, and we feel very uncomfortable. Let's just be honest. It's an uncomfortable thing. And you might hear people say, well, what's the worst that can happen in life? And the answer always is you could die, right? Well, as we look at Stephen and his death this morning, we watch him walk through one of the most uncomfortable things that could ever happen to any person in the world. We're going to see him pummeled with stone after stone after stone, and yet crying out with the most peaceful, most calm, most loving, most comforting and comfortable words we've ever seen, in contrast to a mob and a riot who is described as enraged and grinding their teeth. If you're feeling a little bit angry and enraged this year, if you feel like you're grinding your teeth this year, there is a grace that can come to you to walk through life and death and instill comfort in the midst of the worst storms you could ever face. The Heidelberg Catechism was written in 1563 in Germany. That was written 83 years before the Westminster Catechism, which is the one we subscribe to. So this is a really old catechism, and I love it because it opens with this question. Ours opens with, what is the chief end of man, or why do we exist to glorify God and, and enjoy him forever, which is true. But the Heidelberg Catechism opens with this question. It says, what is your only comfort in life and death? A little bit of a different place to start. Answer, that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've entitled today's sermon, Comfort in Life and Death, because we see Stephen, embrace this kind of life where in life and in death he's entrusted himself that he belongs to his Savior, Jesus Christ. We get a picture of Jesus Christ in this disturbing death that lifts our eyes from the death to heaven itself and lifts our eyes to Jesus. So if you're taking notes, there's three ways that we see Christ, our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, that gives us comfort in this life and in death. So the organizing thought is this, your only comfort in life and in death, following the Heidelberg Catechism, first is the glory of Jesus. We see in this account the glory of Jesus. So remember, he's just preached this masterful sermon, pointing them to Christ, but they have rejected Christ, they have rejected him, they've rejected these news, they're enraged, they're grinding their teeth, and then we get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. Look at verse 55. He, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, God the Father, and Jesus, the Son of God, standing at the right hand of God, God the Father. And he said, this is Stephen saying, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
Now, they don't like what he sees, but let's just pause here and see what Stephen sees with the eyes that Stephen sees. And I don't think he's just speaking in hyperbole, by the way, like I have a glorious vision of Jesus. This is legitimately a revelation from heaven of Christ to the deacon Stephen, pronounced by his lips for all of them to hear and for all of us forever to hear the picture of what heaven truly is looking like through the person, the exalted Jesus Christ. Just like at the baptism of Jesus where the heavens opened and the dove came down, just like Paul had a vision from heaven in 2 Corinthians where he was swept up and saw heaven, just like John the Apostle was swept up and we have the entire book of Revelation, in this dying moment, Stephen is given a revelatory vision of Jesus in all of his glory and he shares it to them and he shares it to us and it brings him peace in that moment. How do we know? First up, we'll see what he says after this vision. So clearly after this vision, he's going to pray for his accusers and for his condemners. He's going to pray forgiveness over them. We'll talk about that in a moment. So peace sweeps over him. We're told literally he's filled with the Spirit. See verse 55, full of the Spirit. So the Spirit gives him a fresh filling. He's already a man full of the Spirit. But in his dying moments, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of peace, the spirit that passes all understanding and gives us comfort in that moment when we need him comes upon him and he sees not the stones, not the angry faces, not the grinding of teeth. He sees the glory of God and he sees the exalted Jesus, Jesus who died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven 40 days later, and now, as Scripture prophesied would happen, the Bible says that the Messiah, that one, that Son of Man, prophesied by Daniel, one like a Son of Man who's given all authority, all dominion, all kingdoms. He went just like the Psalm, Psalm 2, Psalm 110. You can write these down for later. It says, He's, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That Jesus, that exalted Jesus, he gets a picture of the Son of Man, of Jesus, in all of his glory, and it fills his heart with peace. It fills his heart with hope. It brings comfort in that moment when it would have been the most uncomfortable experience any human being could experience. A vision of the glory of Christ a bigger picture of Christ. Now, I pray that we could have that vision supernaturally, not just like share his vision and see it, but with most of us won't have a supernatural vision. I pray for them. But if you don't have that physical rending of the heavens to see the reality of the glory of Christ, it is preserved here in Scripture, just like the book of Revelation, just like these Psalms. We can go there and say, when our eyes get so fixated on the here and the now, when our eyes get so fixated on the grinding of teeth, when our eyes get so fixated on the rage all around us, there is a place you should look, and that place, brothers and sisters, is up. Setting your mind and your heart on things above where Christ Jesus rules and reigns. And there's a powerful imagery here, by the way, that a lot of commentators wrestle with because all of the scripture say that Jesus ascended to the throne of the Father at his right hand and he sat down. Meaning his work is completed, right? Like Jesus doesn't have to forever atone for our sins anymore. He's done it. He's completed it. It is done. It is finished. And yet here in the picture, as Stephen looks up at the right hand of God the Father, what does he see but Jesus what? He's standing. What is the Son of Man doing standing? Here's what I think Jesus is doing in that moment. Stephen is standing for Jesus. And so Jesus is standing for Stephen. Do you see it? He is acknowledging Christ before men in the hardest moment ever. And we have a high priest and a savior 
a God in heaven who not only sits and rules, but when we stand for him on earth, he stands for us in heaven. And as Stephen is about to lose his life and yield his spirit up to Jesus, Jesus is standing ready to receive this servant saying, well done, my faithful servants. Come into the rest and glory that has been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. And so Stephen, in the hardest moment, can stand for Jesus because he sees a picture of Jesus standing for him. And I believe that's been preserved for us so that we, in our moment, when we're tempted not to stand for Christ, would remember that as we stand for Christ, there is a Savior who stands for you and for me. There is one at the right hand of God the Father with all glory, all power, all dominion, all strength. And by the way, as he gets that vision, the Jesus that's standing for him doesn't do this. Zap, 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 zap. Run, Stephen. You're free. <laughs> he has all authority, and yet Stephen has to walk through suffering, through the trial. And I'll say this, and I'll say it until you believe it. If you hold to a version of Christianity that says, if things get really bad and there's a tribulation, Jesus is going to get you out of here before that ever happens, reread your Bible. Because my Bible says, in this world you will face tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And church, I don't know what's going on in 2020. I keep looking to the heavens saying, come Lord Jesus, right? You know, there's like locusts and stuff. It feels apocalyptic at times, doesn't it? You say, could this be it? I don't know. But I know this, if we're going into greater tribulation, we better be ready to stand for Christ through it. And if I'm wrong and all of a sudden we get swept up beforehand, hallelujah, right? But I want you as your pastor, I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready to stand against tribulation because the way I read scripture, glory comes through suffering. And Jesus has called us to follow him, pick up our cross through suffering. And Stephen was faithful. He suffered well. And he suffered well because he saw the glory of Christ. He lifted his eyes from his circumstances to the heavens. That's the first way you'll experience comfort in this life and comfort in death is by beholding the glory of Christ. Secondly, your only comfort in life is found by beholding the lordship of Jesus. Not only the glory of Jesus, his greatness that he's exalted, but also that he's Lord and he is God. Verses 57 through 59 he declares out loud to them and to us that he sees this vision, that he's given a heavenly vision. But listen to this. He's still in the courtroom. He's still before the Sanhedrin, so he's inside right now. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. La, 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 they're stuffing their ears. I don't want to listen to you. They're screaming at him. Shut this man up. We're done with this trial. This is over. We need no more evidence brought. This guy is a blasphemer and a heretic. And they cast him out of the city. So now they're outside. They have gone outside of Jerusalem, which is where everybody who's going to be executed must go outside of the city to cast out what they would view as the sin, to purge the evil from within them. So they're pushing him out. Verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. The first appearance of him, I'll come back to him later. Just hold that because he will become the Apostle Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, listen to this, Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he's seeing at the right hand of the Father, standing for him, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Your only comfort in life and death is a vision of the lordship of Jesus. Stephen, as we'll see, will die in a moment. But with his dying breath, with this vision that he sees of the glory of Christ, his words aren't, Lord Jesus, smite these people. Lord Jesus, rescue me from this danger. Lord Jesus, 
etc., they are Lord, 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 the Lord of the universe. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. A few details. You'll notice that the witnesses are the first one to cast the stones. This is according to Deuteronomy 17.7. These were the false witnesses that were brought up earlier. We hit them earlier in chapter 6 where false witnesses accused them of blasphemy. Technically, the Israelites were not supposed, the Jews were not supposed to kill people. That's why they entrusted Jesus to the Romans. You remember that? They didn't follow that protocol with Stephen. They just, mob justice took over and they, they said, we're going to still try to apply the law a little bit. We're going to apply Deuteronomy. And that was a, supposed to be a check and balance, meaning if you're going to bear witness for somebody's execution for blasphemy, then you better be the first to throw the stone. That's the weed out false witnesses. So these guys were the first. They took off their garments. They laid them at the feet of Saul. That's so that they could get a better throw because the outer garments were constraining. And Saul is over here holding their coats, if you will, approving, nodding, watching this whole thing go down as the stones pummel him one after the other after the other, hitting him in the head, in the chest, in the shoulder, and then the rest of the mob is allowed to jump in until he is buried and killed. And as the rocks hit his face and as they hit his shoulder and his chest and his back and his knees, the words coming out as he stares up to heaven, as they are grinding their teeth, angry, this riot and this mob is, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knows that he's going to die, but he knows to whom he's entrusted his soul, and he knows exactly where he is going. And so in that moment, even of death, comfort washes over him. Peace washes over him. For our scripture reading today, I purposefully took us to the account of the death of Christ, because you'll see a parallel with the death of Stephen and the death of Jesus. Did you catch them? As Jesus dies on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. You remember that? And Stephen now, with Jesus at the right hand of God the Father, says, Jesus, receive my spirit. Last week, I think it was Barry was asking me, where are you, Barry? He's in here somewhere. The other Barry, there he is. He's asking me, can we pray to Jesus? And I love this question because I've gotten it many times. And I, I used to answer it in a different way because I, I used to say, well, Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer to pray our Father, and so you should only pray to the Father. You pray to the Father through the Son and in and with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a good Trinitarian formula. And normally, that's usually how I say, Father in heaven. But verses like this blew up my thinking. Do you see it? Can you pray to Jesus? Absolutely you can pray to Jesus. Why? Because he's Lord. Jesus is Lord. And so you can pray to the Father, you can pray to the Son, you can pray to the Spirit, Spirit of God, fill me. We have example after example. Paul, when he had the thorn in his side, you remember that? He prayed to the Lord Three times. He didn't pray to the Father three times. He prayed to the Lord, and what did Jesus say to him? The risen Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. We have a relationship with the risen Jesus, not just through Jesus, but to Jesus. Do you see it? Say yes. We come to the Lord Jesus. You say, well, Stephen, how does that give me any more comfort than coming to the Father? In life and in death. I'll tell you how it gives you more comfort. Because he died. And he's exalted. And according to Hebrews, he is now a high priest who's passed through the heavens, seated at the right hand of glory, and yet he is a high priest who is sympathetic in every way to you and to me, to our struggles, to our temptations, and even to death itself. So that as you are on the cusp of literally breathing your last breath, you can mimic the words of your Savior as he was at the cusp of giving up his spirit to the Father. Say, Jesus, 
Into my hands I commit my spirit. And you commit your spirit to the very one who rose from the dead. So that as he yielded up his spirit, you entrust yourself to the Savior so that just like Stephen, it's not wishful thinking. Stephen had, by the way, likely a resurrection encounter with Christ. He probably was one of the original, maybe one of those 70 that saw Jesus. We don't have it for sure, but likely. Either way, though, here's the point. Jesus defeated death. When you are facing death itself, Comfort comes in knowing that you worship a Lord who has tasted death and overcome. And tasted death in a way that glorifies God. It's easy to say I believe when everything's going well, right? When we're suffering, when we're staring death at the, in the face, when this enemy is coming to take us and our final breath is here, that is the moment where you look to Christ and say, it's, you are here and you are standing and you are with me and you are alive. And everything I've st staked my entire life on and my death on now is coming to fruition right now. Pray to Jesus Call out to Christ, and in your moment of trial, in your moment of suffering, in your moment of temptation, call out to him because he is alive, glorified, risen, and ready to hear because he is exalted for you. That's the second thing we see from this passage. We see the lordship of Jesus. And before we go to our last point, I just want to again draw your attention to the character here at the end of verse 58, a young man named Saul. Saul, as you know, in chapter 8, if you have the same header as me, says Saul ravages the church. Saul will be dramatically converted on the road to Damascus. By the way, it's not just God the Father, but Jesus that shows up. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. One more example of a believer even an unbeliever, to talking to Christ so we can speak to Jesus directly. But I, I know later as Saul changes his name to Paul and becomes the Apostle Paul, if you're new to Christianity, he's responsible for writing about half of what's left in your Bible. And he's going to pick up and finish out the book of Acts. It kind of goes from the 12 apostles to the deacons and mostly to Peter and Paul. So we are just getting our first glimpse of this guy, and he's described as a young man. At the end of our Bibles, he's an old man, so we have both sides of this. In this time, he is a villain. In this time, he's approving of this execution. In this time, he is ready to take down the church. In this time, he's ready to go and arrest Christians and lock them up. Even those that are scattered because of this persecution, he's not satisfied. He goes after them, hunts them, drags them back to Jerusalem so he can lock them up there and try them in Jerusalem. That's the Saul who is standing right there watching Stephen crying out to the Lord Jesus. And he's not converted at this moment. You see that, right? He's not saved yet at this moment. But I bet you this, I know this from his own testimony. This moment left an indelible mark in his soul. That when Jesus shows up, he's ready to listen. Because nobody dies like that. And nobody lives like that. And this movement, this Movement called the way is what it's called at this point. Is completely contrarian to anything he's ever seen. And what that says to me, brothers and sisters, is how we live and, and how we die, people are watching. Even the worst sinners, they're watching right now. They might not read their Bibles, but they are reading you. And it's leaving a mark on them. Not just what we say, but how we say. Are we grinding our teeth? Are we furrowed in our brow? Are we... Are they our enemies? Or are we, as we'll see in a moment, crying out for their forgiveness? That leaves an impact on people outside of the church. And it left all the right impacts in 
Saul's heart that at the moment of conversion, those seeds that were planted, they grow into a great oak that will never be chopped down and scatter seeds all over the world. The Saul's of the world are reading you right now. In 2020 and every day, by the way, what kind of book are they reading? How are we responding under pressure as we face death to our children and our grandchildren? Ah, oh, it's all fairy tales. They don't believe in it. Are we facing it confident that Jesus will rescue us and has rescued us? The souls of the world are watching and reading us. Look to the lordship of Jesus for your comfort in this life and death. Look to the glory of Jesus in this life and in your death. And thirdly and finally, to find comfort in life and in death, it's found in the forgiveness of Jesus. Glory, lordship, thirdly, forgiveness of Jesus. Verse 60, after he calls out to the Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, he says, And falling to his knees, as the stones are still hitting him, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What a beautiful way for the author Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to describe the savage, barbaric, vicious, bloody events. And when he said this, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, with his final breath, he fell asleep. These final words of the deacon Stephen are not words of vengeance. Lord, destroy them. They're not words of anger. He's not grinding his teeth with rage back at them saying, you're all going to hell anyway. Dead. Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And once again, an echo. Do you hear the echo of Jesus? as his torturers crucified him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. (sighs) Stephen truly has become Christ-like. Would you agree? In life and in death, my prayer for us is we are filled with the Spirit that not only the teaching of Christ, but the character of Christ and the emotions of Christ, the breaking of our hearts, weeping over Jerusalem like Christ, that would be the heart of the church, Manoa Community Church, the church in America, the global church, that if we get pummeled and if we get stoned, out of our lips will be words of mercy. Words of forgiveness, words of compassion, so that as those are throwing their stones, in that moment they're realizing this, whatever he or she believed, and I disagree with it with all of my heart, people like you don't exist. This doesn't make any sense. Makes no sense apart from Jesus Christ. Would you agree? No sense. Here stands a man unjust, unjustly condemned and killed and yet cries out with his dying breath. The last thing he wants the Lord Jesus to hear from him with his living breath, his dying breath, is do not hold this sin against them. Forgive them, Father. They do not know what they do. After George Floyd died, you remember, I went over to the Church of God in Christ and met with Pastor Darren and did some of those live stream Bible studies. One of the things that really affected me, before we even turned on the cameras, for those of you who didn't watch it, go to our Facebook page, you can see them. 
an exhortation to the church, to his almost exclusively black church, towards not forgetting love and forgiveness and mercy in this time. And I just left thanking God for Pastor Darren and for countless black pastors across decades who have shepherded Christ's people through some of the hardest times in this world, in this nation. And you know I'm a fan, I've already said of Tony Evans, that small group is starting, and he says, you know, it's really popular right now in the protest, and he doesn't disparage this, you know, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. He said, I agree, we need justice. But there's another thing we have to remember, church, no forgiveness, no peace. We need both. Because justice demands perfection, doesn't it? Forgiveness extends mercy. And it's at the cross of Jesus Christ that both justice and mercy, justice and forgiveness meet. And you've heard me say this over and over again. I'm going to keep saying it. The church, I believe, is the only institution and the only people who can truly bring peace and unity to our land in 2020 and beyond. And one of my concerns, and I keep saying it, I'll keep saying is I believe the church is backing out and other voices are filling this that don't have the theological categories even to extend forgiveness. And where will the church be found if we pull out? And I am so thankful that Darren and other black brothers and sisters are still speaking the gospel in this time in 2020 and beyond. Just this week, I was reading the article about Jacob Blake's mom praying for a miracle for her son. And in the room, she turned to the police officer and she said, Sir, are you a man of faith? He said, Yes, ma'am, I am. Can I pray with you? She grabbed his hand. She grabbed her son's hand. And she prayed in that hospital room, both for the officer and for her son and for our nation. And she said, I've been praying for our nation for weeks, months, years, her whole life. And here she is, still praying. Thank you, God, for the gospel. Only, only the gospel can do that. Amen? Amen. If you want to have peace in this life, And in death, there's one place peace is found, and it's on a hill called Calvary. And it's a person risen from the dead, exalted and at the right hand of God the Father. He will give you peace in heaven, but he will give you peace that starts today. He will give you comfort in eternity, but that comfort spills into this present evil age, and it is untouchable. And when the stones come at you in this life, Nothing can take that away, and November cannot take that away. Nothing will ever remove that comfort from your life if you lift your eyes up to heaven and see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Church, we were called to stand. Stand for Jesus no matter the cost right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand right now. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, this comfort is promised and held out to you, but it is something that has to be received. Just like forgiveness is something we need to extend, it's something that we need to receive. And before we close with a final song of praise and prayer to God, I want to give you the opportunity to receive that. Forgiveness is a beautiful thing. It not only releases the person that we're angry at, it even releases you. If you come here this morning angry, you come there, here this morning grinding your teeth, if you have a grudge against somebody, it's been said, you don't hold a grudge, a grudge holds you, right? It is poisoning your soul. But Jesus brings the cure to release you so that you can receive forgiveness and extend it.
And the way you do that is by looking up like Stephen did and reaching out and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 